Thank you for watching today. If you'd like to follow along with Pastor's Notes, scan the QR code right here on your screen. You can also find them on our app. I pray that today's message will empower you to use your voice, help change the way you think, and refresh your spirit. We're in the middle of victorious life with our message, Repentance. Pastor Duane is explaining the difference between being remorseful and actually repenting of our sin. Today, I would like to go back to Romans chapter 12 to begin. Now, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, these two verses are the key to victorious Christian living. These two verses. This is where we start. If we don't get this, uh, we will not really walk in what God wants us to walk in. Remember, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So Jesus' goal is that you turn away from this world, you repent, you turn away from the kingdom of this world, and you turn to the kingdom of God. And when he said, it's here, he said, it's available, it's now, it's for you. But in order for us to get to that place where we're functioning in the kingdom, we have to do these two things that are found in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to start uh, with the classic Amplified Translation. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Again, worship is not just lifting your hands, singing. Uh, th th those are forms of worship. Getting on your knees, prostrating yourself, those are all forms of worship. But notice it says that presenting your body to God is spiritual worship. Now, typically when you would offer a sacrifice, you have the altar, you, you've got the wood, and you kill the animal, and you put the animal on the altar and you burn that sacrifice. Now, here's the problem with what happens here. It says a living sacrifice. So here's the problem. The sacrifice keeps getting off the altar. <laughs> it just won't stay there, all right? And so you, you make a decisive decision, and you dedicate your body to God. You say, God, I give you all of my members, all of my faculties, all of my desires. I give my body to you as a form of worship. But your body will want to get off that altar. So it's something that you do once, but then you do it again and again and again and again and again. Right? As often as that body wants to get off that altar, you've got to keep on presenting your body to God. Now, in the, in the last few hundred years, in Christendom, the importance of your body has slipped. Your body is important to God. And what you do with your body is important to God. The Bible tells us in, Cor in Corinthians that you're to glorify God in your spirit and your body, which are God's, because you have been bought with a price. Now, you don't belong to yourself. Jesus purchased you spirit, soul, and body. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to present our bodies to God, which is spiritual worship. And because it's a living sacrifice, you do it once, but you're probably gonna have to do it again and again and again and again and again. Anytime your body gets off the altar, you need to put it back on, All right? And then secondly, verse two, don't be like the people of this world. I think it's interesting, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preaches the first sermon, and the people say, what must we do? And he tells them what to do, and then he says, be saved from this perverse generation. 
He didn't even say be saved from hell. He said be saved from this perverse generation. When we become Christians, we are taken out of the kingdom of this world and we're put into the kingdom of the son of his love. Right? You're in the kingdom of God. And we're, not, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're a part of a different kingdom. And so the Bible says we need to be saved from the perverseness of our generation. The way that Christians live and the way the world lives should be different. It should be different. So don't be like the people of this world, but let God change the way you think. Let God change the way you think. So when you get saved, God does something in your spirit. When Jesus comes back, he'll do something with your body. But in the meantime, you and I need to do something with our minds, with our souls. And it needs to be changed by changing the way that we think. It's called the renewing of your mind. So you need to take the thoughts that you have because you and I, we were brought up in a family, in a culture, in a society that has a certain way of doing things. But God's family, God's culture, and God's kingdom has a different way of doing things. And we've got to change the way that we think. And how do we do it? Well, we do it with the Bible. That's how you change the way you think. A different translation says it like this, but let God change you inside with a new way of thinking. So before you're ever going to see a change on the outside, what you do, you first of all have to change the way that you think. Now, again, how does it happen? It happens through God's word. Isaiah 55 says this, seek the Lord while me may be found and call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So we can not only be away from God in the things that we do, but we can be away from God in the way that we think. Now, it says to forsake. It means to leave, to abandon, to reject, to desert, and depart. And really what it is, it's an Old Testament way of saying repent. When Jesus came, his message was first repent, why? Because the kingdom's here. So you're turning away from one thing, the world, but you're moving to the kingdom of God. Repentance is an inward change of mind resulting in an outward turning back or turning around to face and move in a completely new direction. Now, I've seen people respond to the word of God and cry and cry and cry and literally their nose is running, right? But the next day they live exactly the same way. You can have an emotional experience, but that is not repentance. Now, there can be an emotional experience along with repentance, but there can also be repentance without an emotional experience because true repentance is a change of mind that results in an outward change of behavior, a turning around. I'm moving in a completely different direction. So the wicked man needs to forsake his ways. The unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he'll have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. Now, notice when we repent, God will do what? He will have mercy. He will have mercy. You know, there's a New Testament scripture that messes a lot of people up where God says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll harden whom I'll harden. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and I'll harden whom I'm hardened. Well, God tells us right here how to be one of those on whom he has mercy. Forsake your ways and forsake your thoughts. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I please and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. 
What God is saying is the way that we forsake our ways and our thoughts are by getting his ways and his thoughts, and the way that it comes is through his word. Just like the rain comes down and causes the flowers and the grass and the trees and everything to grow, how many of you know in the next two months, we're going to see a big change outside? It's going to be a big change, right? We got the rain. We're going to have the moisture. We're going to have the sunshine. The same thing God says happens with my word. He said, when you forsake your ways and your thoughts, he said, just like the rain causes the earth to spring forth in bud, he says, my word will do the same thing on the inside of you and me. So when we forsake our ways, the way we're going to find out what we're supposed to do is from God's word. Now, Hebrews chapter 4. Oh, let's start with the second chapter. Hebrews 2 and verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered. This is Jesus. Being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Uh, Sometimes people have the idea of God just being up in heaven and not understanding anything that's going on. The Bible says that is not the case. Jesus came in a flesh and blood body just like yours and mine. The Bible says he was tempted in all points, like we were, yet without sin. And because of that, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So you say, what does that mean? That means when you're in trouble, you're being tempted, go, Jesus, help me. The Bible says he can help. In Hebrews 4, verse 15, it says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So because Jesus understands us, it says there's mercy and there's grace. Mercy has to do with your past. There's forgiveness for your past. But grace has to do with your today. Grace is supernatural enablement to do what you could not do without God's help. So because Jesus understands where we're at, it says you can come to the throne of grace and you can find mercy for your past. You can find grace to help today for the problems that you're facing and you and I are facing right now. Now, when we don't want to... uh, submit to the Spirit of God and to the Word of God. It's always easy to make an excuse. The Bible says this in Isaiah 5, 21. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, imprudent in their own sight. In other words, and I've seen this time and again, talking to somebody, and they will justify everything they're doing. You can do that in your eyes but it does not change the truth. God doesn't change. Uh, Something is not right because you think it's right, and it's not right because I think it's right. It's right because God says it's right. And it's not wrong because you think it's wrong or I think it's wrong. It's wrong if God says it's wrong. Now, I know that's very unpopular, and this is even more unpopular. There is a judgment day when we will stand before God and give an account, the Bible says, for those things that are done in the flesh. Uh, We tend to think, and and I've had people say, well, if I could just see this, if I could just feel God, if I could just see a miracle. Um, In Luke, the 16th chapter, Jesus tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man dies. He's buried. Lazarus dies. The Bible says the angels carry him to Abraham's side. The rich man's buried, and in Hades, he lifts up his eyes. He sees Lazarus afar off at Abraham's size, and he cries out, and he says, Father Abraham, he says, send Lazarus that he put the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in torment in these flames. And Abraham explains to him that there's this great gulf between us and you, and nobody from your side can pass to ours, nor can somebody pass from our side to your side. And then this is what he says. He says, I beg you, therefore, Father. He said, send him to my father's house. I have five brothers that he may testify to them. At least they also come to this place of torment. I've had people say to me, 
I want to go to hell because that's where all my friends are and we're going to party. You do not understand. Here's a man who's in hell and he says, hey, send somebody because I don't want my brothers to come to this place. In fact, hell is the loneliest place in the universe because in hell, there is a continual feeling of falling. You will feel like you are falling. How many of you ever woke up at, like you're having a dream and you're kind of like, you think you're falling and you wake up. <laughs> Anybody here had that? Yeah, okay, you guys get it, okay. But there's this continuum. It's called the bottomless pit. Uh, but he says, I'll send them. And this is what Abraham said. No. He says, if one goes from the, to them from the dead, they'll repent. And this is Abraham's response. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. He said, if, if the word of God, if you will not receive the word of God and let the word of God change the way that you think. He says, you will not be changed by miracle. He said, you would not be changed if somebody rose from the dead. It's God's word that he's given us. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 says, every part of scripture is God-breathed and is useful in one way or another, showing us the truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Think about the children of Israel. They've been in Egypt, and they saw the 10 plagues. Then they, they went through the Red Sea on dry ground when God opened it up and, and literally destroyed their enemies in the sea. Every day, manna is falling from heaven. Water comes out of a rock. There's a cloud that goes over them at day to keep the sun off, and at night, it glows. It's like fire. How many of you like a nightlight? I like a nightlight. Well, they had a nightlight. God supplied a nightlight. They go to, they go to, to Mount Sinai, and God comes down. They, they see the thunder and the lightning, everything. They saw all these miracles, but yet when God said, I've given you the land, they didn't believe it. You think miracles would, make, would change you? They won't. They won't. Elijah the prophet is sent to a widow in the town of Seraphat. And he gets there. It's a, there's a famine is in the land. And he gets there and he says to her, uh, uh, please get me a, a little drink of water. And as she's going, he says, and bring me a little cake. Just bring me a little cake. And she says, well, all I have is one handful of flour and a little bit of oil. And I'm going to go make a little cake for my son and a little cake for me and we're going to eat them, and we're going to die. How many of you know that's not really a faith declaration? <laughs> we're going to die. And he says, well, go just like you said, but go make me a little cake first. Can you imagine if some liberal reporter got a hold of that one? <laughs> Prophet takes widow's last meal. <laughs> and he said, hey, thus says the Lord. He says, you do this, and that cruise of oil will keep pouring, and that flower will multiply until God sends rain on the earth. Well, she goes and she does. And every day, she takes her, puts her hand in that bin of flour, and it comes out full. Every day. Every time she pours that cruise, the oil keeps coming out. It is a continuous miracle. She doesn't get a miracle. She gets a continuous miracle. Right? Now, then her son dies. And she comes and she says, oh, man of God, have you come to me to bring my sin, sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he says, give me your son. So he took him in his arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed and he cried out to the Lord. He stretched himself out over the child three times, cried out to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. <laughs> and Elijah brings the son down and says, see, your son lives. Now listen, then the woman said to Elijah, by this I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth and is true. Like she'd been having a miracle every day, but now she gets another miracle. She goes, oh, but because of this, this because of this, I believe until tomorrow, until tomorrow. It, 
if, if, if you don't believe the word, the Bible says you will not believe though there be signs and though there be wonders. Now, um, Jeannie and I lived in Mexico for several years. And we had some, some uh, we had a guanaba tree in our, in our backyard, which was, which was wonderful. Right? Um, we, I remember the first church that uh, Jeannie and I pastored. We had bananas growing in front of the church, you know, kind of like as shrubs, banana trees. It was awesome, right? Bananas grow in Mexico. Bananas grow in Jamaica. Bananas grow in Brazil, but bananas do not grow in Alaska. You say, why? Atmosphere. Atmosphere, right? Um, Places and people create atmosphere. Uh, If you're out at a club and there's music and dancing and partying and alcohol, how many of you know that creates an atmosphere? It creates an atmosphere. And the enemy tries to get us in the atmosphere of the culture that we're in. Places have influence on you. Places have influence on you. And so do people. In fact, I like to say it like this. Wrong voices bring wrong choices. Wrong voices bring wrong choices. Um, Jimmy Evans who's considered to be a marriage expert, says that divorce is a communicable disease. And what he means is this. If you find somebody getting a divorce, almost without exception, you will find that there's people in their life saying, you ought to get rid of that jerk. Why, you can do better than that. Why, you know what? They don't treat you right. And what you ought to do is you ought to, you got somebody who's there encouraging you. The truth is, when Satan wants to attack your life, one of his premier strategies is to bring somebody into your life who will introduce compromise. I'll say that again. One of his premier strategies is to bring somebody into your life to introduce compromise. Now, in Proverbs 6.23, it says, the commandment is a lamp and the law of light. The reproofs of correction are the way of life to keep you from to keep you from, and it mentions the evil woman. How many of you know there's just as many evil men out there? So, so the Bible is saying two things. It says the word of God, all right, and right voices. Mentions those two things, the reproofs of correction and the word of God. They're both mentioned, all right? It says they're to give you the wisdom to know that there are some people that you need to break relationship with because they are having a negative effect on you. In fact, you you can kind of tell if it's somebody God sent or somebody the devil sent. If it's somebody God sent, they're going to encourage you in your spiritual life. But if it's somebody that the devil sent, they're going to do the exact opposite, and they're going to try to bring compromise into your life. So wrong places and wrong, wrong people, wrong voices are strategies that Satan uses to bring wrong things into our lives. And, and of course, sometimes things look right and they sound right, but they're not right. You just need a word from the Lord. And, and for all of you guys, let me just give you this, this word. You, I think you know this, but when you get married, uh, you surrender everything to your spouse. Everything is co-owned and everything is co-administered. So that means that the money is not my money, it's our money. And whatever it is, in fact, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 7, my body is not my body, it's our body. Very unpopular verse also, okay. (laughs) But everything. So, including friendship. If Jeannie says to me, you know, you're hanging around with that guy, and I just don't feel comfortable with that relationship, do you know what? I'm not hanging around with that guy anymore. And, and sometimes it's, the, it, it's your spouse or somebody near you that sees something that you don't see. And usually it's your spouse, the, per- the person that is, is the closest to you. Now, 
um, particularly today, and I would even say particularly in uh, West Michigan, there's so many churches that never, ever even address the devil. They never address the devil. But remember, you know, the Bible says give no place to the devil, but there's only one place you need to give him, and that's a place in your theology. Because the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, resist him. Steadfast in the faith. Now, when it talks about resisting the devil, he comes with thoughts, right? He comes with ways. He comes with the results of his, of his kingdom, right? He comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. James 4, 7 Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, I've had people actually say to me, well, we just preach Jesus. Well, that's what we all want to do. We want to preach Jesus, but this is what Jesus said. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, those that are bound by the devil, the recovery of sight to blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed by the devil, right? Jesus did not ignore the devil. In his ministry, Jesus addressed the devil. In fact, if you look at Jesus' ministry, you find Jesus doing really only a couple of things. He would preach and teach. He would heal the sick and cast out devils. That's what Jesus did. Preach and teach, heal the sick, and cast out devils. Now, the Bible says resist the devil. And this is the truth. I, I went to church for 20 years and had no idea how to resist the devil. Never resisted the devil one time. But the Bible says if you resist him, he'll flee. And the last time that you resisted him is the last time he fled from you. So let me just say this. He has eaten a lot of people's lunch because we do not resist. But the Bible says you, you submit to God, you resist the devil. And somebody says, well, when do you do it? All the time. All the time. You cannot play with the devil. I, I, I read this uh, recently. It says, a man found a snake on the road and having compassion, he took it home and nursed it back to health. After spending much time with the snake, he felt any danger or did not feel any danger being around it. In fact, he had grown quite fond of it and practically considered it a pet. Then one day, as he was feeding the snake, it bit him on the hand, and its poisonous venom quickly spread throughout his body. As he lay dying, he looked at the snake with complete disbelief in his eyes and said, I took such good care of you. I fed you. I kept you safe. How could you bite me? The snake without the slightest bit of remorse, sneered as it hissed and replied, silly man, you knew I was a snake when you took me in. No. That's a picture of sin. That's a picture of sin. We think we can play with sin. Somebody said sin is like getting a baby lion, and you can take it for a walk. But after a few years... You're not taking it for a walk. It's taking you for a walk and then for lunch. <laughs> and that, that, that is what sin is like. Now, in the Christian life, right, we need to feed on the Word of God. You feed on His Word. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and is useful and showing us the truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. The Bible says, as newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So literally, it's like it's God breathed and we breathe the word of God in, right? But then in prayer, we breathe his word out. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. We need both the inflow of God's word and the outflow, right? The inflow is in receiving the word of God that you can grow spiritually thereby. But then it has to flow out. If all we ever do is just receive the word, we literally dry up. 
And if the person doesn't receive the word, but is just constantly in prayer, they tend to blow up. You can dry up or blow up. But when we have a balanced Christian life, there is the word of God flowing in and the word of God in prayer flowing back out. See, I want to thank you for being with us today. But I want to ask you a question. I want to ask if you're right with God. Some of you, you're away from the Lord. At one time, you lived for him. Others, you don't know where you stand with God. But the Bible says this. It says, know that you have everlasting life. We're not supposed to die and find out if we're right with God. We're supposed to know today, right now, that you're forgiven and right with God. And if you don't know, I want to invite you to pray this prayer. Or you're away from God and you say, I want to get right with God. I want you to repeat these words with me. Just say, from your heart, just say this, say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. And I believe he rose again. And I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I'm going to live for him every day. Jesus is my King. Jesus is my Lord. I thank you I'm forgiven, a part of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer from your heart, you really are right with God. You're forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. Now, I wrote a book, and I want you to have a free copy of that book. You can download that book. Information is right there on your screen. Or you can contact us, and we'll get you a hard copy. We love you, and God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, you are making one of the best decisions of your life. We are so excited for you. Just as Pastor said, we'd love to send you a free copy of his book, Your New Life. Log on to walkingbyfaith.tv and have it mailed to you. Download it right there instantly, or you can find it on our app. It's absolutely free and a great resource for you to have. We'd love to connect with you. Scan the QR code on your screen with your smartphone. From there, you can follow us on your favorite platform, download our app, become a partner, and much more. We'll see you next time. Have a blessed week.